And thanks again for joining us here on the Gill Athletics Connections podcast. Uh, always a joy to have one guest a week. And this week, we're going to have two. We've got, uh, and this is no... Um, no hyperbole here. I've got double trouble here. Help me welcome <laughs> from the great state of Nevada, one of my favorite universities, UNLV. I've got head coach Yvonne Wade and assistant coach Larry Wade. Yvonne and Larry, how are you? Thank you for joining us. We are great and we are very excited to be here today and hang out with you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Happy to be here. I was going to say, Larry, are you not excited? <laughs> I'm always excited. <laughs> Well, I am too. We've known each other for years now. And so, uh, and it actually, you know, how we got to know each other was a little bit like this format. We just didn't record it. We saw each other. I, was, I think it was at a track meet and we started talking and just got to know each other. And then uh, I, I, I held my word. I said that I would come out to Las Vegas for your birthday one year, Larry. And yep. I remember you told me when I said that, you said, yeah, okay, we'll see. Yeah, I didn't believe you. I didn't believe you were going to show until you showed up. <laughs> and we had a great time, actually. We did. It was a great intersection of one of my former lives, a professional poker player, and one of my, my main lives, track and field. And a common friend of ours is our good friend, Huck Seed, uh, who just got inducted into the Poker Hall, Hall of Fame. Fame. Yes, yes cool. he did. That's we cool. actually had him. We had a home meet yesterday, and he actually came out and shagged some javelins for us, believe it or not. <laughs> I do. That guy is just, he's a, he's he's a, just great a track guy. fan and he's he a great is. guy. Good yeah. Guy. Love him. Love him to death. Well, let's, uh, we got a lot to talk about today. Let's take a step back and let's find out how did you get to UNLV? Uh, normally, you know, that's our whole discussion here on the track and field uh, connections podcast is your whole career. We'll do a little bit of condensing uh, so we can talk a little bit more about what we're doing at UNLV and some of the exciting things that are happening. Uh, but who wants to start? I'll, I'll let you guys uh, flip the coin or who wants to start and tell us how you got to UNLV. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let ladies go first. How about that? Well, I appreciate you, Mr. Wade. <laughs> Um, so this, I am now completing my 13th year at UNLV. It's been a long time. It's gone really fast. Uh, this was my first head coaching gig. I was an assistant coach at Long Beach State um, previous to that for three years and um, uh, assistant coach at Sacramento State where I was a volunteer at first and then uh, one year on the official staff. And I, honestly, I got into track coaching by accident. Um, I was still training to be an athlete and competing for the Japanese national team and my hometown is Sacramento and I was using their track and the head coach, uh, Joe Neff Ben asked if, you know, I'd be willing to help some of his athletes once in a while. And I said, sure, you know, pay back. I was in pain to use the facility. So I might as well give back to the program. And I loved it. I fell in love. You know, uh, my first job ever was a gymnastic coach. So I always loved coaching athletes. So it just kind of took second nature to just, you know, uh, train some athletes and we had some competitive athletes at that level um, and haven't turned back since. And so this may be a terribly dumb question. You said you, one of your first coaching jobs was in gymnastics. Were you a gymnast? I was. Okay. I was, <laughs> I was a dancer. I was a gymnast. I was cheerleading. I didn't run high school. I mean, I didn't run track until my senior year in high school. Holy cow. Now that's interesting because if you've done any kind of bio work on Yvonne, she was pretty good. I, I do have to ask, your Twitter handle is Yvonne Wade 1112. Is that your 100 meter PR 1112? Uh, no, that's our wedding date. <laughs> <laughs> that is. I wish uh, it was my 100 meter PR. That would have been great. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was when I was like, holy cow, 11. I mean, I knew you were fast. I was like, 11, 12. Uh, that's but my how, homage to my husband. Yeah, how, uh, <laughs> how sweet is that? And Larry, your Twitter handle is not Larry Wade 1112. That's, I'm a little <laughs> disappointed now, sir. You know, she definitely makes it challenging to, to keep up to the. the the tool of measurements which she set in front of me but i take it like this she's the, she's definitely the beauty and the brains and i'm just the enforcer i just kind of go along i'm the plus one so you know we all, we all have our roles so right. long, the earlier we learn them the better our lives are so that's that's uh, that's important i also put right. that number there so he'll remember when it is so you know <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but when she said one one two one one twelve, what is that? I'm trying to figure it out. Oh yeah, because you knew her PR, and you're like, yeah, yeah. I did, yeah, yeah. I was trying to guess. I'm glad she said it because you would ask me, and I'd be like, uh, and then I have trouble when I get home tonight. So you said Sacramento was home. 
and uh -huh. you went to the University of Colorado. We know you ran there, big time star. A lot of uh, back then, what were we? Pac uh, eight, big eight, then? big eight, big eight. Um, yeah, and so a lot of championships there. And how many you you made? You ran for the Japanese uh, national team. How many Olympics did you make? I ran in the 1996 Olympics. That was my senior year when I graduated CU, and then the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney. And then I tried for 04, um, had some health issues that year and just missed out and figured it was just time to put up the spikes and start a family. You know, I'm always impressed when people make the Olympics, you know, that's a, it's a rare club, right? And, you know, when they get the, um, the tattoo, like, it's always like, oh yeah, you, you 100% dessert. I mean, it's a unbelievable uh, club that, you know, only 0.011% of the world gets to go to two Olympics. I mean, that's, uh, uh, I don't know what the initiation is for that club, but you, you deserve everything <laughs> of that for that. Uh, you said when you first started coaching, you were just naturally drawn to it. Uh, what, what, what about coaching was so natural for you? And it was, uh, you know, kind of became a passion. Yeah, I think, you know, anybody who's known me for a long time, I really like the mentoring aspect of coaching. You know, you take somebody in one spot and you make them better. Um, your goal is to make them better. And um, I've always looked at coaching as a way to help young people develop on all aspects, you know, not just on the track, but just to be better people, be better students, be better human beings. And through track, I've been able to do that. And I think it's just a great marriage, um, you know, especially with my husband being a part of that, because we kind of fulfill a well-rounded purpose in our coaching um, journey. You know, he's, he's definitely the hammer and he's going to get it done. And I think when I hired him, he asked me what his job description was. And I just said, win. I got everything else. <laughs> so we are very, you know, balanced in that way, but I've always, you know, take that family approach and, you know, really want to nurture these young people to be better humans and, you know, running fast and jumping far and throwing far is just a, another layer of that. And where does that come from? You know, a lot of times that type of, uh, I'm going to call it nurturing, but you know, it's total development, not only on the track, but off the track as, as young men and women uh, in society. Did that come from, or your parents, teachers or coaches, or were there influential coaches you had in high school or Colorado or even uh, post collegiately? Well, I think, you know, my mom was a single mom and you know, she just always was a hard worker, but she always wanted to present us with every opportunity to be successful. And then along the way, I've had coaches, friends, mentors, myself in different arenas that just really showed me, you know, the kind of the all-inclusive way to, you know, lead people. And I was inspired them, by them. And, um, you know, I just work every day to, to make somebody better. And so you mentioned being at Sacramento State, and then you went to Long Beach State, which is a beautiful facility. It's one of my favorite facilities around from there to UNLV. Yes. Uh, first head job. What were you thinking? Were you ready? Or was it no. just like, let's, <laughs> let's just do it. Let's just go and figure it out. <laughs> Absolutely not. I was not ready. Um, you know, I remember telling Andy Scythe, who was the head coach at Long Beach State, um, that the job had opened and I was interested in getting it. And honestly, I wasn't really thinking about it at the time. But um, I remember I had family that lived here in Las Vegas. I knew that at the time the team was struggling a little bit. And I remember saying in my head, if any job opened up that I would take, it would be Las Vegas. And you ask and you shall receive because literally a month later, the job posted and I'm like, oh crap, now I got to really. <laughs> yeah. What do they say? And so speak it just it worked out. Existence. They, they say, speak it into existence. That, That's uh, right. Wow, yeah. Holy cow. What, what was it about Las Vegas? I mean, it's a unique. I had family here. Yeah. Um, you know, I knew it was a program that was kind of struggling at the time. And um, I always like to take kind of the underdog and try to make it a better place. Mm. And then we were definitely the underdog. Um, we had a lot of years of hardships and it was a struggle, you know, the first few years to kind of change the tides of how things were. Um, but we're committed. I love the city of Las Vegas. It's a great place. You know, I have a lot of family here, um, you know, and with kids, it's just great to be somewhere where you have that support, especially in what we do. And we're going to learn, Larry, you didn't, this was in 07 when you joined Yvonne. Uh, Larry, when did you come to UNLV? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the tricky part. Um, uh, actually, my wife had talked to me about possibly being a coach in, uh, I want to say, summer of 2013. And uh, I said, nope, did not want to be a coach at UNLV. 
And the reason I didn't want to be a coach at UNLV had nothing to do with other than the fact that I wasn't sure if I wanted to work for my wife. You know, yeah. that was the thing, you know, being with someone who is a leader in the manner that she is and, and hopefully not to take offense, Yvonne, but an alpha female as well. And having to be directed by one daily and at the same time go home and be directed by that person as well. <laughs> I didn't know how that was going to work out for me because I consider myself also to be an alpha male and a leader as well. So you got two who have very similar uh, personalities in the same arena and coaching the same events. You know, it could be challenging. So I wasn't sure if it was something I wanted. So I told her no for that reason only. And just like always, my wife has a very unique way of convincing me to do things that I don't want to do. So see, this was, I'm going to say June of that year. And then by, or even May of that year. And then by October of that same year, she got me to uh, leave my state in which I was in California, leave my paying job at the college to work for her. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't know that, but when I first came to UNLV, I was a volunteer. I, I left a job getting paid really good money to, to work for my wife for free. Well, look, if you're going to be a good recruiter, first of all, you got to be a good recruiter. You got to convince people to come to places. And sometimes you got to have them come on as a walk-on, Larry. I mean, yeah. you got to earn <laughs> scholarship yeah. you gotta earn that scholarship that's right and so uh, uh once i said yes i was like okay well what do you want me to do what do you want me to coach and she asked me she openly asked me what do you want to coach and i said where are you the weakest at at this moment she had just graduated uh, a young lady who ran 11 3 and emily and another young 11 4 girl and you and they had just graduated so the cupboard was kind of empty I ended up with receiving a 1216 girl, a 1246 girl, and a 1260 girl. Those are really good hunter hurdle times. Wow. Yeah, too bad it was a hunter. <laughs> oh, we didn't have hurdles in the way. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. So I said, okay, give me your worst event. I'll start there. And it was a very, very, very challenging year. Uh, I hadn't been in a space where um, I had run that slow. I got three eleven nines out of the, out of the year, but. I hadn't been in a space where I had done that badly from a, you know, even regional slash national level. And uh, the next year I was ready to quit. I'm like, nope, this is it. I did my part. I said I would help. It's over. And she wanted me to continue. And I, I can't continue like this. And, and not because of any other reason that for those who know my, my life away from uh, track and field, I'm a professional trainer to to elite athletes across the board from NFL to NBA to Major League Baseball to now professional boxing. I make my money off my reputation. So losing and really, really losing and not, <laughs> not making finals and girls run 11-9, it was something that I, I felt like would hurt me if I continued. And well, my wife was like, go ahead. Well, let's pause there because what, what we need to figure out still is how did you get – so we, we heard we heard the last year uh, of getting to UNLV, but let's back right. up and introduce people to maybe, you know, Larry, you, you've got some age on you. Not everybody is going to know who the great Larry. Yeah, I don't, I don't know I, if I should give them my nickname for you. I, I, this is how <laughs> I uh, uh, the, the, unfortunately, a lot of people, not a lot of people, very few people, but high level people have this nickname for me. This is for me. Larry is Larry Mofo Wade. That is, hey, that's didn't my know that. Guy. Yes, yes. The yes. camera went off there. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought he wanted to hide his expression when he <laughs> realized what the uh, the nickname was. So let's take a step back, Larry. Tell us a little bit. Uh, we learned about where Yvonne grew up and how she got into track and what it meant for her. Talk to us about your background in track. Well, I'm a little jealous of my wife in this regard because, as you heard, my wife said she ran one year of track and field in high school and got a scholarship to Colorado. It took me many, many more years than that to be that good, and she did it in one year, right? So I, uh, I'm i from I'm from a little town called Giddens, Texas, where I was born, uh, graduated from Elgin High School, which is in Texas as well. At that time, we had about 3,000 people in the town. So I am definitely was born and raised to be a country boy. Ended up uh, winning the state championship and national championship in the hurdles 
uh, my senior year, getting a scholarship to go to Texas A&M University, where I went on to, uh, I don't even know how many conference titles at this point, I think maybe four or five. Uh, not like my wife who has like eight. I don't want to get in a competition, but she'll beat me. <laughs> but, you know, it was like, I think five times there, five time All-American, I think a two-time national champion and graduated from Texas A&M. And then uh, got an opportunity to run pro where uh, Nike sent me to California to train with one of the best coaches ever in the sport of, of track and field and that John Smith. Uh, to train with a group at that time, uh, called HSI. And oh, I, don't had, think I, I don't think I realized you were part of HSI. Yeah, we had some of the fastest people in the world at that time. Oh, uh, yeah. And my group was uh, Maurice Green, who gone on to be Olympic champion multiple times, and um, Otto Bolden, and uh, Rie Jose Perez, John Drummond, uh, Quincy Watts. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a vicious team. At any given time, you had at least four guys that could run sub 10 in 100 meters of practice. Were you training at UCLA? Is that where you we were training at UCLA? What, what right. years were you there training with them? Uh, from 1998 through 2000, I'm going to say six, is what I'm going to say. One of my fondest memories, I was in San Diego working with Brent McFarlane, the uh, Canadian Olympic coach. He had brought his uh, kind of junior team and uh, some young seniors down there for like a warm weather clinic. It was uh, over December. And so we popped up to uh, UCLA and we got to see you guys training. So, we, you know, Maurice and John and Otto and all them. And uh, I got this pretty cool, uh, for me, it's a pretty cool picture of me and John and uh, Otto together because uh, I'm taller than all of them. So I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> uh, but one of the funniest things was we sat behind you guys on one of your recoveries and you, know, you guys were just jawing at each other and telling stories. And Otto started telling this story. I'm probably going to get it all mixed up about his uncle or dad back home raising chicken and slaughtering them and I mean we you know I was yeah, that's probably happened that yeah. probably happened I, I was sitting there, I was like I was like you know I had this expectation you guys were you know the cream of the crop and I go and here they are in their recoveries talking about crazy you know, yeah, crazy right 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 exactly <laughs> that was a people didn't realize that's constantly how we work daily and that's why we were able to do such in my opinion great things because we didn't make it more than what it was we were just country boys you know Maurice coming from Kansas, Otto being from Trinidad, me being from Elgin, Texas. You know, we were all just young country kids out here trying to be successful. And this was this was our opportunity. So you had a successful professional career. How did you how did you transfer to coaching? When did you know it was time to transfer to something outside of athletic, outside of uh, being an athlete? I actually had. Uh, I wish I can sit here and seem extra smart and that I had it all planned out, and put it all together. I have not been in charge of anything that's happened in my life since I started. I uh, have to give all the, the glory to God because he guided me in so many different ways to get to where I'm at right now, even coaching. When I got started coaching, I didn't say, you know what, now I'm not running, let me coach. That's not what happened. I had a friend who was in, who needed my help. His name was Dominique Arnold. Dominique had moved to the East Coast to train. Uh, his coaching situation changed. He didn't have a coach anymore. And he, he asked me if I would coach him. Now, Dominique was a competitor, of mine, which is crazy. Uh, he was a competitor of mine, but he would always come out and stay with me for a month each year just to train with me. So when the time came, he asked me to train him. I didn't really want to do it. But, you know, your friends, you do stuff for your friends that you care about. And I said, OK, I'll do it. And so the first year I trained Dominique, he ended up making the world championship team, ended up running 1301 in the hurdles, which is my PR, which was his PR, too. Uh, he ended up being ranked in the top three in the world. And then less than a year later from that point, or maybe it was right out a year later, he broke the world record in the hurdles, running 1290 to become the American record holder. And it wasn't until that moment happened that I felt as if this is what should have happened for me. Now, I did have signs prior to that. As I said before, John Smith being as great as he was and is, he actually had a back surgery in 2001, which didn't allow him to travel to Europe for the international season. So he, he says to me, I'm an athlete. I'm only in my second year pro at this time. 
he says, Larry, you're going to be giving the workouts overseas and training Otto and Maurice and Inga Miller and Curtis Johnson and Bernard Williams. And you're going to be training all these guys with the workouts and I'm going to send you and then you can train after that, right? So for most of the summer, I was coaching those guys, right? With, but of course, John guided me via phone or whatever. And then when the World Championship came that year, Maurice got first in 100. Bernard got third in the hundred and Otto got fourth in the hundred at the world. So we only missed one spot. That was a sign then that maybe I kind of knew something, but you know, I still wasn't sold on it. It wasn't until Dominique broke the world record that I said, maybe I do know a little bit about this coaching thing. And then I got the head coaching job in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. When I became their head coach, that kind of, I still wasn't sold to be honest with you. I wasn't sold that I really could do this alone. Were you right. done competing when you got the? Yes, I was done competing. So I was done competing. I wasn't sure if I could do it alone because I had guidance from John Smith leading up to that point, except for with Dominique. Dominique was my only athlete that I was training. And even then, you know, John would, you know, pitch in and say the things he needed to say to help guide that situation. And so once we went to Saudi Arabia and we won, I think, nine gold medals at the Asian Games, which is something that they really put a lot of pride into. I asked if God, if this is what you want me to do, let me be successful. And I was, and I retired from running. So coaches are some of the most, um, well, first of all, they're the most selfless people in the world, right? You work with on the college level, 18 to 22 year old, other people's kids. Uh, and we're going to get into some of those uh, sacrifices that we have as parents and, uh, and as um, uh, couples with that. But you also are some of the most intelligent people in the world. You, you know, you know how to plan things out. You know how to talk to people. Uh, there's a million things track coaches could be doing besides coaching track for both of you. You know, Larry, for in that situation, you just uh, gave us there, you know, asking God, Oh, is this the right place to go? What else were you considering? And same question for you, Yvonne, as you were getting it, you were volunteering at Sacramento, you were still running and it was well, but what, if coaching wasn't, Oh, this is what I'm going to do. What were you guys thinking individually for careers? Well, you know, I had always saw, I actually went into college thinking I was going to be a civil engineer. I, I was a math nerd. Um, you know, but after a few of those calculus classes and all these other things, I was like, okay, maybe not. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to work with people. I love working with people. And I called my mom and told her I switched from engineering to working with people. And she cussed me out. <laughs> Are you kidding? You're going to be poor. You're, you know, like <laughs> my mom's this little four foot seven Japanese lady. So she can pack a punch though, you know? So I heard it. Well, you should be a, you know, engineer. You went all to these I was in every math engineering camp and club in high school. Um, and so, but I made that decision because I really liked the social aspect of working and developing people. So, you know, um, when I decided to coach, when I fell into coaching, I had to kind of transition into, you know, what I was going to do after competing. I even got my real estate license. I was kind of, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I worked at a group home with some um, um, at-risk kids, you know, and I really like enjoyed that um, as well. Um, but when I started coaching, I was like, you know, this is it. And actually Andy Scythe had reached out to me, um, when he was trying to, um, hire someone. And so I took a trip down there and had a conversation with him and was sold. That tells us a lot about the success that you have had, because it's one thing to know the science behind coaching any event in track and field. And there is definitely science behind it, but it's the people that you have to reach, especially when we're talking about, again, these 18 to 22 year olds, you have to be able to reach the kids. And so that you, your bend was towards people like that makes so much more sense. So you have a lot of uh, the intellectual side of it, if you will, behind you, you know, the science, but then at the end of the day, if you don't know the people, right. it, it isn't going to happen. That's absolutely. Larry, what about you? What, what were your other uh, options? Yeah, that was the part that I think a lot of times that as elite athletes, we don't prepare for as much because I think we have something they call Superman syndrome. And that is, you know, you're a superhero and it's going to last forever until it doesn't. All right. So I think in my behalf, I wasn't really thinking that, you know, the career was going to ever end. I just always knew that if all else fails, I had a, a degree from AM and I could become a teacher like my father. 
uh, for the most part, my dad was a biology and chemistry teacher and physics teacher. So my entire career entire, growing up, I was like, okay, well, I want to be like him. So if this track thing don't work out, now I wasn't going to teach chemistry, physics, and biology. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be more like English or something or social studies or something. But I, I did not think that I would be teaching those uh, subjects, but I did think I'd be a teacher. And so that was going to be my secondary option. But when you're, and Yvonne, you can, you can comment on this, but when you retire from the sport, you're usually, most of her is in our 30s. We're usually between the age of 30 and 35. And what people don't realize is when you come out of the pro world and now you want a regular job, here you are 30, 35 years old with zero work experience, right? So that means like most high school, I mean, college people who graduate, they've done some type of intern, they started at a low level paying job and over five years kind of worked their way up the, you know, the, the ladder. Here I am from making six figures a year, every year to applying for jobs where I have a 21 year old hiring me and say, hey, how is $30,000 a year? You know, that's a totally different thing, but you have to take because you have no experience in anything else. So that's kind of how it unfolded for me where I just got lucky, put myself in a couple of situations where I was coaching and ran into Carmelita the Jetter and got a couple of world medals with her and kind of changed the tide. You know, you brought up two really good points there to discuss. One is when to hang up your spikes, if you will. Uh, you know, you think about someone like a Tom Brady who, you know, after winning so many Super Bowls and has played for so many years, people are like, well, you know, why don't you just retire? Like you're, you're retiring on top. Why go to this? you know, this stage where, you know, maybe you play for three or four more seasons, Tom, and you know, you don't need the money, but now you're barely making the play. Like you could have stopped on top. Right. And if, if he would have listened to the critics, if you will, he, he would have three less Super Bowl rings, right. He would have retired right. several years ago. So that's one really interesting aspect. And then what, so as you're working both of you with high level athletes and you guys have each had athletes that have had pro careers, whether they were extremely long or even, you know, one to two years, right how do you as a coach mentor them of that life after track? You both had this experience, which is uh, amazing to, to have as a coach. Like if I, if, if you were coaching my kid, I'm like, well, gosh, what do they recommend? They've, they've done it. They've lived it. Not just, you know, had a couple of kids that have done it. They've lived it. How, what is the responsibility of a coach for that um, counselship, if you will? Well, I take that very, very serious. You know, as I've, kind of evolved in, in my role here as a head coach and kind of seen the tides of other, you know, student athletes that have graduated and kind of been left out to the wind <laughs> to fend for themselves, um, really have created, um, and I, I can't take all the credit because, you know, our athletic department def definitely does a great job trying to provide other opportunities of, you know, internships and job placements and, you know, all the little things outside of the oval um, that are important to guide them. But for me, and when I sit down in somebody's living room, that's the cell. Like, I'm gonna, we're gonna get you fast, we're gonna get you better, but I'm going to make sure that you graduate with a degree that matters, that you are in place to get a job that matters, that you'll enjoy, um, that you're gonna get connected, you know, with the people, the right people to get you in line with what you gotta do. Now, you can lead a horse to water, not everybody will sip it, um, but that is always my goal. Um, to make sure that they have all the resources they need to put themselves out there so that that transition between college and real life isn't so rough. Because I think for me, it was rough, but Larry, it was rough. <laughs> you know, um, it's not impossible and you, all, you know, ultimately get to where you want to go to. But knowing that in advance and kind of preparing them for those, those moments is, is really part of what we do here. And it's, in, it's two different stories, right? Maybe it's three, four or five different stories, but you have the superstar athlete who goes to the professional circuit and makes a living, you know, can, can make 50,000 plus, 100,000 plus, et cetera, depending on what their level is. And then you have uh, the, we'll call them the semi-elite, if you will. I don't know a great name right. for it. Someone who's trying to make teams. And it's like, do I put a hundred percent in my basket for a year or two or four years if we're talking about an Olympiad or do I hedge and I try to do a training along with internships or a part-time job? I mean, that's a, that's a tough balance, no matter what you're doing. 
I'll let you take that, Larry. <laughs> well, here's the thing. My, my wife sounds amazing. She sounds like a commercial right now, so I can't really build on much of what she said. I agree with 150% of what she said. Uh, my personal approach to that situation came from a different angle because I started coaching pro first. Mm. I didn't start out in uh, the college area or the high school area first. It was elite professionals going to world championships, going to Olympics. And that's where I started. But even then I would see those mistakes being made, uh, not only for myself and the people that I trained with that did it at a high level, but also the, the athletes at that moment that were pro. So I've kind of changed my perspective and my view of what my job is. At one point, uh, I was trying to prove to the world that I was the best sprint coach on earth. And my goal was to get my athletes to run as fast as they can and get them to the world championships and get them to the Olympics. But then I realized that is a, such a small uh, majority, I mean, minority of the group. You're talking about less than 1% get there, less than 1% make it to that level. So if 99% of the people that you touch will never get there. So I started changing my view. I started using track and field as a platform, an opportunity to not only get them to run fast, but to teach them how to make a step further in life. I had made a goal of myself over the last three, four years where any elite athlete that I coached, one of my main goals was to make sure they were able to purchase a house when it was over whether they did it through track and field or they had another job on the outside, but at least putting them in a position so they understand what it took and put them, connecting with people to help them do that. And I think up to this point, if I'm not mistaken, Yvonne, you and I have been part of at least 10 different houses being sold to our athletes in the last, I'm going to say five years, just because we want to see them have a life outside of track and field. And if track and field works out for them, then great. But if it doesn't, they find themselves one step further than they were when they left, came to us. Uh, I'm a little speechless because, you know, we're in, not even we're in this time where it's a me now, you know, get it and spend it, you know, get it and live it. Like, but, but I remember myself as a 22 year old, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, to, to see long-term is extremely tough for a 22 year old athlete who is now racing against her idol, you know, and is, is uh, working towards running in Jamaica and overseas in Europe. You know, that's a, that's a fantasy life, really, if you think about it compared right. to quote unquote real life. What's interesting to me, you know, I focus uh, a lot on the coaches, right? And so I'm dealing with when that athlete changes and becomes a coach. And I see a lot of the same as we're talking to coaches around the country about their long term. And there's, uh, you know, we, we, there's a ton of clinics out there for people to go to learn how to coach someone to run faster, jump farther, throw farther, etc. There's not a lot of discussion about career development as a coach. So what that means for your financial health, your relationship health, uh, if you're going to become a head coach, how do you hire people? How do you fire people. That's part of a professional coach. If you're going to have a staff, how do you get hired? What do you do for resume networking, et cetera? And there's little to none of that around. And we just kind of fall into it. And, you know, maybe 15 years into our career, we go, Oh, I figured it out. Well, how do we make it in the first five years of our right. career? We can have better coaches and better coaches uh, lives uh, if we started earlier. Yeah. Well, I believe that the, the sports, as from a coaching standpoint, I think the bar is going to always continue to rise because now you're starting to see more elite athletes turn into coaches, whether it's at the college level or the pro level or even the high school level. Level, So you're going to see that development. But I, I, I learned this from my wife. I really wish I could take credit. She has been the, the, the lead in regards to having to make them more well-rounded. And, and that being said, things like you didn't even mention this, but one of the things was credit, helping them understand what credit is, how it works, how to develop it. My wife even has helped me try to be more aware of what I do and how I do it. And but without that, you, you don't understand what your true capabilities are because credit is power. And a lot of times in college, when most people make their mistakes, buying from Forever 21 on those credit cards and whatever else. And so that's just one aspect in which we try to cover, which I know was never covered in school for me, in high school or college, or in any developmental uh, seminars we went to co coming up through the sport. 
And we want to be able to at least give them that information. And my wife has definitely been the lead on that because even I say eight years ago or 10 years ago, wasn't pushing that direction. I changed my view once I moved uh, out to Vegas and changed the whole view of how we do things. There, there's some irony there that you moved to Vegas and started working on your credit. <laughs> there's, there's something there. And, uh, uh, former, we had former UNLV coach Karen Dennis on the show a few weeks ago, and I was uh, interested with her story that her, I can't remember if it was her father or uncle or someone in her family, maybe it was her mom, said there's two things you can affect. So she, she had an, she's one of the few of us that had it ingrained into her as a, as a high schooler was you can affect your GPA and you can affect your credit score. And those two things, whether you think they are important to you or not, that's how people will judge you <laughs> for a long time coming uh, as you go through a young adulthood up into adulthood. So I love that you're talking to your athletes now about, it. you know, when they, when they come into school, you're talking about those things that are outside of the track and outside of the classroom true as well, which is sad that this, this is the kind of stuff that should be in classrooms. We just, we just had a team meeting the other day about accountability and time management. And um, I am a stickler for time. You know, we're track athletes, everything's on time. So if you're a minute late for a hundred meter race, you're missed the race. So um, you know, I constantly try to ingrain that we still have, you know, a handful that still are trying to figure that out. Um, but, you know, I leave people on the bus. If they're not at the bus, I, I take off. I don't care if they're in the parking lot. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes it's hard lessons that are going to teach them in the long run how to be, you know, more accountable in those jobs and those careers that they aspire to have, you know, and my goal is to always have them leave here with the best set of tools possible um, so that they can be successful. Because I don't feel like if they don't, I didn't do my job. So Larry, catch us back up. We are, were the head coach of the Saudi Arabia team. How did we get to UNLV? And we haven't heard the story. How did you guys meet? Yeah, you knew this was- That's a separate conversation. Con let me clip this one because that's a totally different conversation. So, <laughs> I heard you don't have any plans tonight. So we got a long time to hear it. So it's all good. So, so, so I get the Saudi Arabia job. I do well there. And then I decide to come back to the US. Uh, I got offered a new contract to go back to Saudi Arabia. I turned it down and I was like, okay, now what do you do? Well, Dominic Arno wanted me to continue to train him. So I, I picked up Dominic Arno and then I started training some other athletes. One of those athletes was Carmelita Jetter. I met her ran randomly. She was at that time an 1147 sprinter. And I started having an opportunity to coach her. That was in 07. And, uh, 07, she made the world championship team. So did Dominic Arnold, her first world championship team ever. She ran 11 0 that year from 11.47. Um, Dominic made that team at the end of the year as well. When that ended, Don Carmelita was a world champion and also got third at the Worlds. And that kind of set it up the following year, which was over eight year Olympic year. I decided I was going to work uh, at Pasadena City College because I wanted to use their facility. In order to train my professionals, I picked up a few more. Siobhan Starter, Candace Davis, who is Candace Davis Price now. And uh, let's see, Rodney Martin. Well, Rodney ended up running 995 that year in 199 to make the, the Olympic team. And Candace Davis got second at the World Championships that year in the hurdles with 790, I believe, indoors. And uh, Siobhan made the Olympic team as well for Japan, I mean, from Jamaica. Uh, the 400 hurdles. I want to say she ran like 54 one or something, but that was the push. And then I started coaching at the JC level, uh, coach at the JC level briefly, got an opportunity to go coach at San Diego state. This was in 09. And this is when I ran into my beautiful wife again, again, right? Again, again. No, that was a mistake. I reached out that to you before you got to San Diego state. Yeah. But I said, this is an opportunity. I got to run into you. Okay, get it right. <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, she reached out to me prior to that to try to get me a coaching job at uh, Long Beach State. This is before I even thought I wanted to be a coach. I wasn't even thinking about being a coach. Hmm. But she heard me coaching some of the people on HSI's team when I was an athlete, and she felt like she was impressed with whatever it is I said. I don't remember what I said. And she tried to get me the Long Beach State job. By the time I got the information, it was a little too late. So uh, I, I missed that opportunity, but I ended up going to San Diego State in 09 and uh, 
I saw my wife at a track meet. Now, she's not going to me to tell you this part of the story. Now, my wife and I have known each other since 96. We saw her at, well, uh, let me not lie about that. My friend thought she was absolutely beautiful. Do you hear me? He was talking to me about this girl from Colorado. She's this beautiful girl. She's fine. She's fast. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Right. And so uh, the situation was such that I didn't know if she really was going to be as beautiful as she was. Right. So when I saw her, I tried to pretend like I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed with how she looked or anything. And I told my friend, I said, well, that's cool. You can like her, but she don't want me because they all were going to date the winner. And I'm going to win. Right. That didn't quite work out the way I thought it was going to work out. So I won my race and ran relatively fast. I think like one of the top three times in the nation. You know, I run through the line, stick my hands up in the air, look at me, look at me. And she won and ran well as well. And I looked at her like, hey, you see me? And she just kind of rolled her eyes at me. <laughs> so it didn't quite happen the way I thought it was going to happen. I thought once I won, she would be crazy about me. She didn't care about it. She didn't care about it at all. So I was extremely disappointed. So because she didn't like me, that means I can't like her now either. So, so her and I were not friends from 1996 all the way through 2009. That's like 13 years. When you say you weren't friends, do you mean you did not like each other or you just did not become friends? No, Both. I did not like him. <laughs> you did become friends. I didn't like her. Wow. I forgot. Track to... people, you know, we all run in the same circles and stuff. And Larry, we all know Larry, but he got a little arrogant cockiness to him back in the day. So, you know, I was like, mm. I, I forgot to add my disclaimer. You know, you guys are my third, I think, married couple together. My disclaimer is no divorces occur because of the Gill Track and Fields podcast. Okay. We, we got to, <laughs> all right. We, 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 uh, if we got to do some counseling, we will, but no separation. No. No, no, we're like, good. We're good. All right. All right. Now we've already accepted our place. So yeah, sure. That's a good point. <laughs> he didn't like me. I didn't like her. I'll be honest with you. I had no real reason to not like her other than the fact that she didn't like me. Uh, but she, but my attitude toward her. And so in 2009, I get the, the assistant job at San Diego state. Now I'm in the Mount West conference, which is the same conference UNLV's in. So I see Yvonne at a meet. This is the part she's not going to want me to tell you. I see her at a meet. It was a, it was an early meet. It was a Northern Arizona meet. We get there. I see her. I can't wait to go talk to her. Not because I want to say, hey, let's be friends. I want to kind of rub in her face and look at me now. I'm at your conference kind of thing. And I walk over to her. And as I'm talking to her, she's not even looking at me. She's looking at the track. So I'm talking to like the side of her face. Right. And I was like, yeah, I got the job at San Diego State. And she looked at me. She says, I know. Right. And just and I'm like, yeah. So, you know, uh, I'm here. And, she, and she's like, uh-huh. And not even paying me no attention. So right before I leave. And this is the part she didn't want to tell you. Right before I leave, because I could tell she's not giving me any real attention. And I was like, whatever, right? She turns around and she looks at me briefly. She said, you know, I'm going to kick your ass, right? <laughs> you see wow. my mouth? Wow. What? Wow. I didn't see that. I did not see the competitiveness coming out of her. And when she said that, she put herself in a realm that I'm very comfortable with, right? You want to compete? All right. That's what I do the best, right? I said, oh, yeah? All right. You can't coach yourself out of a paper sack, right? He did say that. He did say that to me. That was your right. response? That was my response at the time. I mean, I think it has to be clear. You were not after her. You're not chasing. I mean, no, we just, yeah. we were not. This is, Absolutely this is not. adversarial. We was not. 100%. 100% adversarial. <laughs> so what I thought it was. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was hilarious. I really did. I thought it was funny because I had never seen that side of her. She always was the, it still is, the, the take the high road. I'm not going to say anything. I'd rather walk away from it than to address it. But I guess all those 13 years of us being, you know, at each other in, in a very negative space, well, she was not going to let me walk away without leaving me with the parting gift, right? And so 
that ended up being the year that we actually started becoming friends because we see each other every week, compete every week. And anyone who definitely coaches at a college level understands that a season is a very trying and challenging thing for you. You got to deal with athletes, you got responsibilities, you got success, and then you got failures. You got a lot of things you got to manage and hold. And sometimes having peers can help you understand where you're at because they've been there before. And for me, it was very helpful to be able to have her and actually her assistant at the time, who was Pamela Arts, who's at uh, LSU now. It was very good to have them in place to be able to you know, give me some experience in regards to what actually happens in a season and how you're supposed to conduct, conduct yourself in that moment. And so by the end of the year, we were cool. We were, we were all cool. We didn't have any more grievance. I could tell she had a crush on me, though, but no. Nah. <laughs> well, you know, the obvious question is, is who made the first move, like for the first date or the first like, OK, because you go from adversarial to, all right, well, you know, we can be cool. Uh, but who made the next like, hey, maybe we're more than cool. I plead the fifth. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say. I wasn't gonna I, say anything. I was just gonna see what she was gonna say. I plead the fifth. I, I was the pursuer. <laughs> nice. Uh, I think that goes into your competitive nature. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm, I'm very goal driven. You know, that's yeah. that's the coach athlete side of me. So yeah. yeah. So she made the first, uh, I guess, initiation, and I had a conversation oh, with her. Oh. <laughs> initiation. <laughs> You know, the, the, is that like entanglement? Is that the same thing? <laughs> Very similar thing. <laughs> so she, uh, her and I, you know, went out on a date and, you know, a date was over and I said to her, you know, I'm not really looking to be in a relationship, right? And she says to me, oh, you thought I wanted to be with you? I don't want to be with you. I was confused. I had never had anyone tell me. I was about me. to say, Larry, first of all, you're always running, aren't you? Like, oh, I don't want this. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I'm not trying to get. But when someone lets you run, it's like, oh, oh, oh wait a minute. I, oh, oh, wait, what do you mean? That's exactly the way it was. I'm like, wait a minute. Hold on. What do you mean? So uh, here I am I'm going through my own personal resume in my head. I'm like, wait a minute. I got a degree. You know, I, I, I look halfway decent. Did you know, you have, I got. Did you have the goatee even back then? I had to go tea, but it was black. It's yeah, I was like, that's kind of your signature look. So I was just wondering if you had that. Okay, so I'm going through my head like, why wouldn't she want to talk to me, right? I'm, what, what else do I need to fix in me, <laughs> right? But it just ended up that that actually got my attention even more, and made me pay more attention to her, opposed to uh, me being in my own world. I started looking at her. See anything she had going on, those things became more attractive to me as time went on, you know. And I was like, dang, she's amazing. She can, she cooks one time for me, one time, and that, that one time was the she can cook though, but at that time, she was only cooked one time to kind of like her best dish, in my opinion, that she kind of like hooked me in. And then I thought that's life every day. She cooks these amazing egg rolls. I mean, if you ever get a chance, you gotta get them. Make she made them the first time she cooked for me. And never gave it to him again until I got married. You know, when I got married, I took him again. I'm like, I, I don't want to call Yvonne an evil genius, but she's genius. Yeah. She got me to leave my job and work for her for free. You know, something's not, look, she's, I don't know what to call it. I'd be nervous about her. But that, that's what ended up happening. And then next thing you know, we, are, we start dating. Uh, I want to say around 2010, somewhere around there. Would you say 2010 somewhere? And then, uh, we just kind of was, you know, trying to fill each other out. Then my son came around not too long after that. We, well, we got married first, and then my son came. And we've been we here. We were still in different states. He was still in L.A., and I was still here. Yeah, which I was, was going to ask, which for most people, maybe they don't know, that's not a – that's a very common commute, the yes, L.A. to Vegas. But it's not an hour down the road either. I, I, I did it once when I lived out there. I want to say four and a half. Four hours, five, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of the most boring drive, by the way. It's, you, you, the, it's yeah. a desert outside of the Vegas county. Out of right. county it's all it, – yeah. all you see is headlights and taillights. It's all you see heading to L.A. or coming back, yeah. 
So you guys made the long distance relationship work, which is not an easy thing as well. Um, and then until my son was born. Oh, and then th that was when I was like, all right, we need to, yeah. When, when born, we came up what we thought was going to be a good plan for us to co-parent. She was going to bring him to me for a week and she would keep him for two to three and then I'd get him for another week. And because of track season, we went through a period of time where I didn't get to keep him for about four or five months, right? And what ended up happening was she brought him down to visit me and he cried the whole entire time. And I couldn't take it. I couldn't take it while my son would not, didn't know who I was, you know? And so it was at that moment we started discussing about the possibility of either her moving to California or moving to, I mean, moving to Vegas. And shortly, not too long after that, I ended up moving to Vegas. Again, another interesting aspect for couples who have long distance relationships, uh, the stereotypical approach is the wife moves towards the male and you've, you've flipped that. We're going to learn a lot about these flipping the, the, the stereotype, if you will, uh, you decided it was better for you to move to Vegas, even though you had apprehensions, not necessarily not moving to Vegas, right? But you had, you uh, talked with us earlier about having apprehensions of working. Right. Did, did you say, make sure I'm not saying this wrong. Did you have apprehensions working for your wife or with your wife? That's two different things. Uh, I think I look at it the same. I think for and with is the same for me. Um, uh, I had apprehension because of that. I didn't know how I would work in that situation, especially a leader and being in charge of my own thing as a head coach. And I've been training professional athletes my entire life to be able to come here and have someone tell me what to do, opposed to just be doing. <laughs> and that was that was going to be the challenging part. And uh, you remember we were talking about that mad genius thing my wife has? So, somewhere along the lines, if you let her tell it, she tells me now she knew that I would always get here. And because remember at, at the time I was volunteering, I would always get my professional stuff going here in the way that I've had. And she knew I would always be successful doing it. I didn't know that, but she somehow knew that. So that's what ended up happening. I moved here and started out rough, really rough, trying to make things happen for myself. But over time it worked out. And she ended up having a longer time to boss me. Yeah, you said you had apprehensions of, you know, taking orders from, you know, her, or, you know, specifically her. Did you not ever think you were going to get married? I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's the definition, well, I, I think. I, I, see, the thing is, I've already accepted the, the home side of things, right? My dad taught me very well. You know, you can be in charge by letting them believe they're in charge, something like that. Oh, we yeah. say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really the, that was really the play right and so I was already okay with that but I was very used to being the king of my own world from an athletic standpoint I always made the decisions because I came from pro I decided what the athletes did when they did it how they did it when I became a coach at Pasadena I was a head coach so I decided what we did how we did it where we went to I made all the decisions but then you go into a situation where you go from not making all the decisions to being told what you're going to do. That part was what I thought was going to be the hardest part. But when it came down to my wife specifically, she actually allowed me to coach the way I wanted to coach. She didn't tell me who to coach, how to coach. She allowed me to do it on my own. And when she gave me the description of just to win, that really helped me focus more because that put me more in line with the pro professional line of thinking. She was like, I'm going to handle everything else. I'm going to make sure that academics is in place, travel's in place, budget's in place, people are at where they need to be. She's still going to coach, but she wanted me to carry this load over here. And when she did that, that fit right in line with what I'm used to. So I kind of created it, treated it like it was a professional team per se and more of an elite group. So Yvonne, I can understand larry side of it because i'm a male who's also married to a female and another strong personality super intelligent uh, she also allows me to believe that i'm in charge and <laughs> the reality is the opposite and i could see where um not that i would have problems working with or for my wife it would just be more of like you know we need our own both of us we need our own 
things, Thanks. if you will, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, I, th I think that's why you know it works really well with my position here at Gill Athletics. You know, I travel a hundred plus nights a year, and over COVID, you know, this is the longest we've ever been together. <laughs> you know, without me traveling, I'm just now starting to kick back into traveling. But Yvonne, you're clearly an intelligent person. What concerns, if any, did you have with your husband being on staff, and did you know from his background, because it seems like this part where he, where you gave him the job description of just win, seems like that was part of, again, that, um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and term it evil genius, even though there's no evil to this mad genius. Let I don't me, know about <laughs> Say it again. I don't know about that. It might be some. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You, earlier, you said, you changed it for me, Larry. You said mad genius. So I'm going to go with that. So was part of your mad genius, your, your, your intelligence of how to work with people, with him where you like, oh yeah, I, 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 I can't give him this description of dot, 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 dot. I got to say, go win, which has its own, you know, there's a lot of things around that. Was that part of your plan or was that just the luck? Um, I think, you know, just timing and everything kind of worked out, but, you know, he, taking back to the, the original time when I recommended him for some other jobs, I've always listened to him when we were in the same venue training, I remember being a professional athlete and being at UCLA at, um, you know, visiting that campus when training sometimes and hearing him coach other people when he was an athlete. And even though I didn't like him at the time <laughs> as an athlete, I always remember thinking, gosh, he knows his stuff. He is so smart at coaching. And I've watched him, you know, when he was at San Diego State and at Pasadena and how he gets people to perform. And I'm so, and I'm still very impressed by that. He is amazingly, and he's a mad genius at that um and because we were developing you know our team and at the time we we're kind of rebuilding um the UNLV brand I knew that he was the right person for that job to really change the tide of the type of athletes student athletes that we got here to not settle you know just because we're a mid-major school doesn't mean we have to have mid-major mentality we have to operate like a big power five and go after those same types of athletes um, and so he really helped me with that aspect of it you know flipping that script a little bit um, and so one thing I think I'm good at is putting people in places and roles that can help the team get to where we need to be, you know, and I knew he's a, he's a coach. I mean, he's, it's in his blood. He's great at it. He can see things that the naked eye cannot see. Um, and I've known this for, you know, for a very long time, even when I didn't like him as a person <laughs> and didn't want to date him. Um, but he's still, you know, that genius coach. So how do you, one of my favorite questions to ask married couples on a same staff. So when I work here inside the building that I'm at for Gill Athletics, you know, I'm here eight to 10 hours a day. And when I come home, I get to hear her side of her day. And, you know, she's working for a website. She's a mom. Uh, she's a substitute teacher. She's a fitness instructor. So I get to hear it's, a, it's like escapism for me. I get mm -hmm. to hear and listen to her day and then vice versa. Her escapism for me, for her is hearing what I did for the day, right? You two don't have that. Uh, you have the same, you were both on that track for X amount of hours and you recruited and things like that. How do you deal with not letting track be completely 24-7, 365 days a year for your relationship? Well, like I was saying, you know, he, he has his uh, professional athlete side of things and he does, he works, gosh, I don't even know if you sleep, babe. Um, a lot of hours. Sometimes he doesn't come home till very, very late at night training his, um, you know, his boxers and whatnot. Um, but for me, and I'm a little different than Larry in the sense that Larry is 150%, you know, coach. He, he's, he can talk athletics. He can, I, mean, I remember one night, two o'clock in the morning, he woke me up out of bed just to get into a block start, get into the blocks, get into the blocks. I'm like, what are you talking about? Two o'clock in the morning. He's like, I had an idea about block starts. I'm like, I'm going to sleep. <laughs> So, um, you know, his mind is always working about, you know, thinking about performance and how to get the athlete better 24 seven. I'm different. Like when I come home, I want my off time. And, you know, so I guess when he's training, you know, his boxers at night and I'm at home with the kids, that's my off, you know, and then when he comes home late that night to talk about whatever, then, you know, I have to give him that space to do it. Cause I know he needs that, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's challenging for sure. You know, not a lot of sleep. <laughs> Um, but you know, that's what he does. That's in his blood. And he knows that, you know, my time is my time and he needs, I try to encourage him to have his own time, but he never does because he's a workaholic. Um, 
but now that you know we have kids and we're doing the family you know we're trying to make sure that we find time for each other outside of sport and athletes um just to make sure our two boys are are growing and having the time of their lives too and you've got two awesome boys in fact uh i showed so i don't know if both of them are but one of them is in taekwondo amongst a lot of other stuff your kids are very active which i love uh, my kid is also in Taekwondo. He just got his uh, red belt a couple months ago, but you posted recently on Twitter. Uh, is it Brand- Brandon? Brandon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, uh, you said he was testing for his orange belt and he was nunchucking like the last <laughs> Bruce Lee movie I saw. So I showed my kid and I go, maybe they do Taekwondo a little different in Vegas. Son. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't touched nunchucks in our, our, our dojo or whatever we call it. Right. And uh, my son just goes, that ain't Taekwondo. It's like, I don't, know, I don't know what that is, man. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah. Just, By the way, if an orange is not, you know, that's only the third or fourth belt. I can't imagine what he's going to be as a black belt because he was doing something with those nunchucks, man. Let me tell you, I was like, I, I'm yeah. extremely impressed. So you have that as an outlet and as a responsibility. Uh, when you go home, you kind of cut right there. Now I'm mom. Uh, you know, I'm working with the kids and all the things that go, you still got to run a household and things like that. Larry, for you, because I'm always um, uh, concerned about coaches who say they're 24 seven and that they wake up at 2 a.m. to do block starts, which uh, I think my wife, <laughs> I think my wife listens to this podcast every once in a while. Honey, if you're listening, I will not do that to you. I promise, I promise. Uh, because you do have to have escapism, right? That's why we have hobbies. That's why we have, um, you know, we, we do things like travel and etc. For you, Larry, you have this very in-depth boxing coaching career. Where is it fair to call you a strength and conditioning coach for high yeah. level boxers? Okay, so you do. Yes, that. is that your escapism? So you're still. Uh, I don't even want to do air quotes. You're still coaching, but it's right. not in a track and field setting. Is Correct. that your escapism with this boxing? And tell us a little bit about what you do for. I, I, w- I would say yes, because I am uh, addicted to being successful. And that's in everything that I do. I don't have to do anything. I put 100% into everything I do. And I want to be successful at everything that I decide to put myself into. So if track was all that I had, it would be a situation where I would just be track 24-7. And eventually burn, not only burn my wife out, but burn out all the athletes and everyone that I train as well, because everybody doesn't have the same mentality. And I took that. I learned that later in my career. I thought everyone who was great or wanted to be great had to have that same compulsive, uh, addictive mentality. But that's not true. Um, And so I learned later in my career as a coach that having that outlet, which happens to be another sport for me. Uh, is needed. And so what I've learned here is when I finish my day at UNLV and my wife gives me the okay to go, then I go train my boxers until eight, nine o'clock at night. And when I get home, then she's able to tell me not about UNLV because we've been there all day together, but she gets to tell me about the boys, what they were doing, what they didn't do, what they got planned coming up. And then I get to tell her about all my different boxers and the boxing situations and their families and how what we got next. So it becomes fresh in that regard. And, um, but I will say this, and this is the first time I actually openly verbally admitted this at this point in the boxing world, for those in the sport of track and field who don't know, I am the number one strength conditioning coach in the sport of boxing. And I've had over eight world titles at this point. And none of that would have been possible if Yvonne Wade wasn't my wife. She is the one who has allowed me to to stay out late nights and and work with these young men and women. Uh, Also, she's the one who supported me and has supported me in regards to continue to push forward in this area and has been understanding when I had to miss important dates like I had a fighter who fought the day after Christmas and we had to go to Atlanta for that. So I left before Christmas came. I missed Christmas day. And we I had to fly my entire family to Atlanta, even though I missed it on Christmas day, I was with them the day after Christmas. So we have, I've had to miss very important days and moments in order to, we had Christmas early just so I can kind of get to this fight. So 
she's allowed me to do that. So there's no way that I could have elevated in two sports without her support. One sport is hard enough. So her guidance and support has definitely helped me in that area. And I thank you for that. So at this moment, that's my workaholic mentality has been the reason why we have that break. Yeah, I want to give a shout out for uh, Lane Fletcher on Twitter asked us, how does Larry Wade find time to coach track and train as boxers? I think he gave us a great uh, answer there to help us understand that. Uh, I love that quote that you just gave us there. You're addicted to being successful. And I really think, you know, as soon as you said that, it, I, I actually thought about the relationship side when Yvonne was like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't, I'm not after you. Like, oh, you thought right. uh, yeah. because you, A, you're addicted to being successful. You're also, you know, winning is a habit, right? Yes, it you, is. You've had a lot of winning through your career. Here was one, this, uh, on the surface level, this was, wait a minute, I, I have to win this then. Wait a minute. I, 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 I gotta go chase that. <laughs> I, I didn't think of it like that. I guess that's one way to look at it. The good news is, is it turned out to be not just a superficial chasing and a relationship, et cetera. It became right. a real family. You know, that's the the blossom of it all but as soon as you said uh, addicted to being successful i was like wait a minute i was like hold on that explains a lot a lot a right lot. Yvonne, and, you, oh go ahead and 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 in saying that when i said it earlier and in her saying she didn't want to date me um uh, it's what really made me force me to pay attention to the details of who she was and what she's about because like you said, I guess it could have been a situation where I was chasing to conquer and then once I conquered it was over. But because I was forced to really view her and appreciate her for what she was, it's what allowed me to say, I really like this woman. She's like really great to being able to say, I really love this woman. If I hadn't been forced to do that, I would accomplish my goal of just, just getting her and really having no real purpose with her. So that actually, is probably the reason why we've been able to make it to this point. Absolutely. We love stuff, right? We love being given stuff, but what do we cherish the most? Things that we had to earn, earn things right. that we had to sacrifice for, right? and maybe things that we didn't understand, so we had to learn about it right. as well. All, all earn, earn, sacrifice, and learn. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, again, on Twitter, a uh, good friend of ours, Stephanie Sleeka, she's the head coach of Nichols State University down in Louisiana alumni, uh, uh, do you call it alumni? An alum of the Connections podcast. We uh, had her on the show a couple weeks ago. She was awesome. She had a really good question. Uh, I'm going to read it as she wrote it, but I'm going to open it up just a little bit because it ties in nicely with what you guys were both just talking about there. So Stephanie uh, says to us on Twitter, this one is for Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne Wade 1112, by the way, Larry. I just want to make sure. <laughs> uh, as a mom, what piece of advice would you give your younger self about ba balancing family life with a career coaching track and field that's 24 seven. Now, uh, Stephanie being a mom herself, that's obviously yes. something that's passionate for her and she's doing a great job of, uh, at least the idea. It looks like she's balancing it really well. I think she's doing a great job from what, uh, you know, we're friends on social media. Uh, but I'm going to open that up to Larry. You're a dad, a father. So I'm going to ask this to both of you guys and gals. How do you in a sport and a career that is a 24 seven easily can be a 24 seven all consuming profession? How do how do you balance it? And I love the way she actually posed the question. So focus on that. What would advice would you give your younger self on how to balance this career path that you've chosen? and family, which involves the spouses as well, not just the kids. Yeah, and first I wanna say hello to Stephanie. She's actually my mentee for the USATF CCCA Women's Leadership Program. So I appreciate her, you know, feeling like she had to put a question. <laughs> so hi, Steph, um, and she's amazing. Um, you know, as far as balancing life, you know, I in my later years, I really tried to be purposeful in allotting my time for my boys. Um, you know, they're growing up, one's nine and one's going to be driving here pretty soon. And, um, you know, they, they need us as parents to, to guide them through life. And if I had to talk to my younger self, I probably would say I should have done that more when they were younger. 
you know, I think I spent a lot of time raising other people's kids more than I raised my own. Not that they felt like they were slighted in any, any way, they know they're loved and stuff, um, but they didn't get to travel on Saturdays to their, you know, soccer events as much because we were gone, you know, and, you know, didn't do the sporting thing. Like, and I envy so many parents that, you know, travel their kids to soccer tournaments out of state and go here and go there just to um, make sure that kids are, you know, doing what they need to do. So that part, I probably would have changed a little bit and make sure that, because, you know, our kids are going to be here, uh, track and field athletes are going to be here, the job's going to be here. And I don't think, you know, making more time for that moment would have sacrificed the other. Um, so if I had to redo it, that's probably something I would have adjusted a little bit more. Um, but, you know, just to take ownership of your time now and, you know, cherish the moments because they're growing fast. Like literally we're talking about buying a car for the, the 16 year old pretty soon. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it goes by just like that. And so you don't want to miss those moments, you know, and just to, to protect them. Larry. You know, I guess this, this whole podcast, I guess, is going to sound like a dedication to Yvonne, but I have to give a lot of credit. I, I, think, but, uh, I think as we're listening, we're all okay with that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's becoming pretty clear here uh, who the brains, even the brawn, uh, the the time management. It's all, if you're on YouTube, right here to my, my left, uh, not on the bottom here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the balance thing, one thing that I've, try to learn is not to work as much as I've worked. I've gone uh, 16 months straight, no breaks, 10 months straight, no breaks. I mean, not even weekends off. And uh, I, I've seen how that has caused uh, a dysfunction, not only in the household, but in my own health, where, you know, I've lost that along the way and my wife was fussing along the way you need to rest you need to rest you need to rest and then God sets you down and says you need to rest and then you can't do anything but rest uh, so that is one thing and the reason I said I have to give you bond credit because it's like the yin and the yang you know for what I can't do she definitely feels and, and that would not I would not be there for my kids in the manner that I am if she wasn't there to fill in those empty spots so they don't feel like they did lose out. Big moments come, we need dad there, dad's gonna make time. But a lot of times mom is there and they see someone and they know that I support them at the end of the day. And if I was to give my younger self advice, it would be to, and I, once again, this sounds like I'm just you know pumping up Yvonne, it would be make sure that when you're out here dating and searching that you find someone that challenges you and makes you better because these are the same people who will be raising your kids. That's really important. Um, it's not about making someone feel good. It's not about cheering for them all the time. It's about finding someone that challenges you but yet empowers you to be the best man you can be. And I think that's important. There's many moments when she may say something and I absolutely hate it. But deep down inside, I know she's right. And I think that's important. So I would tell my younger self, don't search for the person who you think is the most popular or the person who's the best looking or the person who just so happened I got all those at one. But don't search for that. Search for the person who you think makes you better. Well, I might make you some egg rolls tonight, baby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was sweet. But I, I have to say this, you know, because he talks about yin and yang and balance. Um, and, you know, I talk about how great of a coach uh, Larry is, and he's an awesome father uh, to our two boys. But what you see on the surface is what you see on the surface. But he has the biggest heart. He has the, I mean, he will work his tail off for whoever needs whatever, you know. And he has taught our sons to be kind and giving. He, we have this mantra well, he has, he created this mantra for our kids. If they are hungry, you feed them, right? So if there's a homeless person on the street, we go up and we give them food. Now my, my nine-year-old son is, hey, can we go buy this guy some food? And we'll go through a drive through get some food, and he'll pull up, hey, sir, are you hungry? That, those little things like that is what Mr. Wade is about. And that's why I appreciate him so much. Listen, if you're out there right now, whether you are single uh, newly married or dating, or if you are 
20 years into your marriage, do me a favor, rewind about two and a half minutes there. Uh, that is important to hear again, what you guys both just said there. Uh, I, I would sum it up with one word and that's sacrifice. You guys are sacrificing for each other. You're sacrificing for the kids. Uh, what you're doing, Larry, with the 10 months and 18 months uh, at a time, the Yvonne, what you're doing, coming home and he's still, or now he's going to boxing. So you're with the kids for three, four, five, six hours. That's sacrificing for each other because together the, it's the greater good. And I, and I love how you <laughs> said, Larry, you said, um, I'm gonna have to rewind. I'm gonna make sure I, I have to put this as a clip as, uh, for the week when we publish here uh, about searching for someone because that's who's going to help you rate. That's who's going to be with you to raise the kids like that. Uh, that, that spoke to me. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm so Especially thankful for someone that's going to make you better. Yeah. So that yeah. this is the person that's going to raise your kids. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, this normally when we're talking to a married couple on the same staff, we're talking about, you know, the uniquenesses of what you're doing. I think a lot of what you guys are doing and showing and leading is applicable to whether your, your other spouse is a coach or not, whether your other spouse is in the private sector uh, or teaching or stay at home. Uh, a lot of what you're talking about here, sacrifice, teamwork, yin and yang, working off each other's weaknesses, working off each other's strengths, that is extremely applicable to healthy uh, not perfect. We don't have perfect marriages, uh, but we have healthy marriages that work together through thick and thin. And certainly Absolutely. as coaches of track and field and boxers and other uh, sports, there's going to be thin. <laughs> it's not always, <laughs> not always uh, the positive. That's, that's awesome. Right. Thank, you. Thank you guys so much for being so authentic and honest with, uh, and open with that. I, uh, that's going to be very helpful for other coaches out there. So thank, thank you very much. As we start to wrap up today, let's talk about UNLV. Uh, talk to us. You know, you guys have each been there now. You said you got there. What, what year did you get there, Larry? Thirteen. My first, my first year volunteer year was 2014. So, okay, so we've each been there for seven plus years now. Uh, talk to us about what are some of the advantages that UNLV's got going on there. Right? You guys are still there, so there must be a lot of positives. Talk to us about Absolutely. the program at school overall. Yeah, so, you know, and this is where I give credit to my husband, um, you know, when he arrived, we had, you know, successes here and there, you know, talented athletes to make it, make it to the national level. Um, but when he got here, um, and I gave him that year of kind of rebuilding, he really challenged me to look at this program a little differently. You know, he said, you, you came from a champion bloodline, I came from a champion bloodline, there's no reason why this team cannot pursue that. And so we got to stop setting the bar so low <laughs> and go after the same athletes that these big top schools are going after. And, um, you know, we, we did that and sometimes we failed and sometimes we didn't, you know, um, and, but over the course of time, we started getting that conversation and people who know Larry as a, a phenomenal coach and know us together as a team, I think really bought into the overall, you know, family environment and that my daughter is going to come to a place where she's going to be protected. She's going to be mentored in a way that she's going to be successful when she leaves here she's also going to perform at a high level and so people started feeling confident that you know that their kids would be safe here um, you know Vegas had comes with a lot of you know stereotypes already um, but I think people when they get here and see the campus and see what we're about they know that you know their daughters are in good hands yes Larry, Larry do you have, <laughs> you have any advantages and positives towards UNLV sir that's a lot of them. Uh, and don't say, if you start out with, yeah, the number one advantage is my wife. No, nah, not this time. This okay, time, even though right, she right. is. I mean, it's worth, I, I get it, but uh, come on, yeah. That's the number one advantage for me. But uh, <laughs> the one thing I've learned, I've been in a lot of different situations, a lot of different institutions. Uh, as you know, I graduated from Texas A&M University as well. What I learned here is you got all the benefits of any Power 5 school, but yet the intimacy of a small school that changes everything for me and everything for them because sometimes if you're in a bigger school you don't get that ability to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with a professor and over time and then be able to have time to help just you they're teaching 300 500 different students they can't afford to just give you time every day at this level you can't you get all the same qualities of any other power five support you got great coaches Great, a great academic staff that's always their great counseling. 
that's there to support us, not only academically, but also emotionally there to help us as well. We have a nutritional center like anyone else. So we have all those great things and we have great coaches, right? We have great coaches that have coached people on a very high level. So they have the experience and understanding. And yet we have that one thing that a lot of schools do not have. And that is the love and the passion to be able to have a true relationship with our student athletes and let them know that we actually do care about them, that they are more than just a number to us, that we want to see them be successful. We're gonna invest in them, not only as student athletes, not only as athletes, but as people beyond the school. They are important to us even after they stop putting points on the board. And that's where I think we take the lead at because for a lot of schools, that moment comes, you did your due, here's your degree, I'll talk to you whenever you come back for homecoming. Our kids, we talk to them still. I've talked to kids from eight years ago on a weekly basis via text or call, just call me crazy, just randomly. And I think that's what it's been all about. It's about creating that type of legacy, not just fast times, because times come and go, record, uh, made and broken, but those relationships never go away once you establish them. And it's at a period of time that really impacts them the most, and that's usually between 18 and 22. So that's what makes us different. And that's why we are we get these type of kids, because we do show them that. I was going to ask, you know, UNLV is um, a tough place to recruit from and recruit to. And what I mean by that is a lot of recruiting is regional, right? So Nevada, it, I mean, it's Las Vegas and then it's desert. So you don't have a huge talent pool. Now you're in Clark County, which is a pretty talented county, of course, uh, but you don't have other, a lot of large cities in Nevada to recruit from. So you're, you're always recruiting a lot of Californian, I would assume, maybe into Texas, I would assume. I was going to ask, well, how do you overcome that? Because to your point, Yvonne, you know, uh, Las Vegas has its own prejudices, uh, meaning people think how terrible it is. I lived out there for a year and I tell people, it's like, uh, when you live there, it is not the same as when you visit for a, a weekend. Right. Uh, but I was going to ask, how do you overcome that? But you just told me exactly how you overcome it. You, 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 you almost shrink Las Vegas into this, hey, here's our track and field and our academic program at UNLV. Here are the people that's going to be involved with you, coaches, athletic staff, uh, training staff. Uh, and that's what is going to be different than if you lived or more so if you visited Las right. Vegas or the shows, the TV and movies and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And, you know, truth be told, you know, during this pandemic, it's been a little tougher than on a normal year because I we're confident when we get parents and kids in front of us, you know, face to face that we can, you know, sell the university, sell the program, sell us. Um, but during this pandemic, it, it has been kind of challenging because we can only do, you know, images and video presentations of, you know, what this is campus would look like. And, you know, and it's a nice campus, it's beautiful, but we're, we're not a Oregon or a, you know, <laughs> Texas A&M. Um, with regards to, you know, facilities and that kind of thing. So um, we just got to be creative. We know we do a lot of Zoom calls and face-to-face -face stuff like that. Um, uh, but it, it, it has definitely been challenging when you don't get to sit down with them and actually create that, you know, that vibe. Uh, so hopefully soon in this, with this is be over and we can get back into their households and, and win a lot more over. <laughs> and, and Mike, there's two major things though. And, I, and I'll, I'll stop on this. There's two major things that we try to offer and make sure that the parents and the students understand, and that is security and success, right? So security is like every parent, we're all nervous about Las Vegas. Oh, it's this and that. We let the parents know that we have a routine of things. We keep it accountable. My wife has created a structure from a timeline standpoint from basically six in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. We have a great idea of where they're at during that period of time or where they're supposed to be during that period of time. That same structure of consistency has also created an opportunity for academic success. And you can help me, Yvonne. I think we, as a team, we got a 3.49 or something. Uh, GPA, what was it? Close to that, yeah. And 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 we've had uh, over a 3.0 GPA for almost as long as I know what, you've been here, what, 14 years? And we'll at least 11 years, team overall GPA. And that I think that comes through the scheduling of routine from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., understanding exactly where they're supposed to be from tutoring to classes to weight to nutrition, all of that counts for that. Now, here's the success part. As a, at some point, you can measure, you know, how, big, how much money was put into a track facility, how much money was put into 
a, a dressing room, something along those lines. But success is success across the board. It doesn't matter. We want our kids to graduate. My wife has over a 90, what, 97% graduation rate, or is it higher? 98.9. A 98% <laughs> graduation rate. There's that competitiveness. Yeah. So, so, so if you compare programs, like we have degrees just like everyone else. She graduates 98% of her kids. She's had 11 uh, years where she has overall GPA of a team over 3.0 or higher, right? And then if you talk about success, you talk about her being coach of the year, three of the last five years in a row, a uh, conference champion. On top of that, having all Americans in the sport of track and field at this program. And when you think about that, even when you try to measure uh, the success as a coaching staff, and I'm not even referring to us as athletes, because we can't beat two-time, you know, Olympic champion over there. So we're not even talking about that. We're talking about being able to take an athlete from point A as a student athlete, from point A to point B, and point B be the location that their mom and dad wanted them to get to from the beginning, and that's to be an elite athlete with a degree. When you do that, now you take you knock all the dominoes down, and they said, now who's the best program? That's how we do it, and that's how we survive, and that's why I still work for my wife to this day. Uh, you know, I'm just... So, so proud that she hasn't fired you yet, Larry. I mean, that's the real. Ooh, I've been on the edge many, many, many times. <laughs> I might get fired today. Today's not over with yet. No, I'm going to make you your Greg Rose first. <laughs> I was going to say, I think this performance review went very well for you, Larry. Uh, I think you're, you're okay. For I should have waited to the end of the year. Uh, I do. You know, one of the things that I think is you know, there's proof in the pudding, right? And obviously, you know, the many, many championships, the many, many athletes, uh, the grade point averages, the APRs, the graduation rates, I mean, gravy, right? I mean, those are, that's exactly what you expect. A kid comes to your program. If I'm an adult, if I'm a parent and I put my kid to a program, uh, I, I want to give them the best chance possible. Well, let's go where they've been able to do it. But I would think also for, you know, the, the apprehension of Las Vegas, you're doing something even more so than coaching the kids and, and, and mentoring the kids on your team. You're raising a family there. There's your biggest proof is in the pudding. It's like, you know how I think good Las Vegas is as far as having a good family with good morals and good work ethics. I've got two to show you right over here. <laughs> we, do it, we do it on a daily basis, right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had uh, one more question from Twitter, Mr. Vince De La Cruz. He says, as a fellow former Pasadena City College Lancer, I guess you guys were the Lancers, huh? Yes, we were. Uh, track and field coach and athlete. He goes, where, uh, when do you see, I love Vince's attitude here, by the way. He doesn't say if. He says, when do you see UNLV adding men's track to its sports program? And he asked specifically about how your pole vault program is doing now. Any talks at all of adding, I don't, did UNLV have men's track at any one point? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, uh, early 90s, I think they, is when it ended. Um, I think both uh, Nevada, the other, our rival school up north, um, both of us lost our men's programs around the same time for title nine reasons. Um, I don't, you know, there ha the conversation hasn't been had, you know, we are a very gen, uh, female heavy institution from a, uh, just a student population. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that ratio has to mimic that, uh, you know, I think it'd be great. I think this is a perfect place to do it. Um, uh, but you know, right now we, we gotta pay the bills, <laughs> the bills we have. So, uh, hopefully one day. It'll, it'll happen. I think it'd be great for the city. I think now with Las Vegas being such a sport Mecca, yeah. you know, it's, it's Las Vegas has changed, you know, over the time I've been here, but you know, with the golden Knights, just at WNBA, the Raiders, um, you know, sports is becoming a very big thing here. Um, and I think our athletic department will, you know, raise up to that level too, to make sure that this is the, 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 to, to, the, the to go place to go to. <laughs> the destination for sports, you know. Uh, absolutely. And definitely on the track and field side, I mean, what a coaching staff. I would hate to absolutely hate to recruit against you guys. That, that would be a nightmare for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> First of all, it, it's not only your success. That's one thing. Uh, but when they would ask like, okay, fine, they're successful, but are they, you know, hard charger, like mean? I'm like, no, absolutely opposite. They're two of the nicest people in the whole world. <laughs> don't, don't let the big shades and hat fool you. <laughs> uh, 
on the other hand, don't let the pretty smile fool you either, because she's gonna she's gonna make yeah. sure you're doing the right things. Good. Uh, Absolutely, guys. I am just so thankful for your time today. Uh, I know how Thank busy you. you are. Obviously, Larry, you don't sleep. You know, she kept saying that about you, but you know, you're two hours time difference from me. And I made a tweet. I was uh, up early for me on a Sunday at around six thirty this morning, and that's four thirty your time. And within forty seconds there was a, a heart, a like to it. And it was her. I was like, what? yes, I was like 4.30. It's like, we, you know, I was like, don't be taking a nap when I see you later on this afternoon. But uh, she texted me at six o'clock and said, did yeah. I see you? It's a.m. I left, we had a home event. So I left the house at 5 a.m. to hmm. make sure that everything was prepared. Man, I'm the first guys? one. I'm the first girl at the party. You know, like I, I've just always been that way. You know, I got to make sure the first one there, last one to leave. So. Well, up at four out the door <laughs> kiss I, him on the head and just sneak out <laughs> does he ever take the hat off oh, at home it's off all the oh, time yeah, at home all the time it's always Look at that. Hat. No, i see it no, I, I he see blames it. The, the hair loss on me but it's not my fault <laughs> that's that's why he's still grew sexy this. baby he grew this to, to bring the attention down here yeah he yeah exactly i know how it is i know it is uh and we still larry you know i told you i'm so fascinated with that other side of the world we i still got you know again you know, no one's traveling and no events and people in the stands, et cetera. I got to get to one of these boxing matches. I've never been to a boxing match. I, I really want to see As soon it. as they uh, open it up, which it looks like they're starting to open it up slowly, especially in the state of Texas and yeah. Florida, you know, so you know, <laughs> the promoters are definitely flocking to those states to be able to put people in the stands because that's where a lot of the finances come from you yeah. know them in the sit in the seats so we will be opening up soon i think by the end of this year december we'll definitely have everything open and so as that moment comes you're definitely welcome I'm this in. year's gonna be a great year for me in regards to world titles there's a few on the line i got some guys fighting for some so this year it's gonna be a big one hopefully uh one of those moments you could come to well, the good news is, is we also have outdoor tracks. So you've got world titles for boxing. You've got outdoor conference. Where, where are you at for conference this year? It'll be in Cl Clovis. Oh, nice. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great area. Yeah. So you got outdoor, you got regionals, you got nationals. Regionals is at Texas A&M. So we oh, get to go to his stomping ground. Man, that's right. Oh, yes. Yes. Geez. Yep. Well, it's also in Florida. So I'm going to go to the Florida one. I'm not. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to <laughs> But the great thing is, is track is back and we're just so excited to see the running rebels, right? I mean, it's going to yeah. be an awesome season. Uh, it's so many great performances are happening right now. So I know the same is up uh, for you guys because uh, your kids are going to be some of the most prepared and motivated kids out there. I know that for a fact. That's yeah, the we, goal. Just had a, we just had a meet yesterday and our girls ran uh, the fastest time in the nation in both the one and the two. And I think we got the second fastest time in the nation in four by one at this point what's uh you know i'm so focused on coaches that i i actually don't see the result kids results anymore t too much so what was the the 100 meters for the um for your kid which which your it was 11 27 and that's that's fast for march the middle of march we haven't even, we don't usually run fast till april tell me so. it was like a five or six meter wind or something 1.8 wow yeah uh if you are in the mountain west get ready <laughs> they <laughs> are coming absolutely well thank you guys so much i do appreciate you guys uh not only your time and attention your authenticity and humbleness today to talk to us about some real personal stuff that's going to be uh you know the goal is always you know it's called connections for a reason it's to connect other coaches that are in the same situation or going to be in the same situation or struggling with the situation that is similar to you and what you're dealing with there in las vegas and a lot of positive things there obviously uh so you know the help that you just did for others is uh you know it's invaluable that's what real leaders do they give and they give and they give without asking for anything in return and so i just love you guys so much for that and obviously thank you so much as, as, a, as a friend of you guys as well you know i'm just so um um just enamored with who you are as people it, it really is awesome to me it's uh it's just a lot of fun to see that what i see on the outside is actually working on the inside as well and i'm so so glad larry that you didn't lose this one and that you <laughs> won. I, know, got, you I won. finally so got thankful. one right. <laughs> out of all your victories. I am the lucky one. He makes me better. Out of all the victories, this is your greatest. Well, it, it is. And then it begets your other ones, the kids, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Ones. Go home, get those egg rolls. Uh, one day when I'm in Vegas, because you I got you. Out, I got to figure it out. Yeah, I got to figure yeah. it out. Come over. Maybe if you come, maybe you can make a cook more. So yes, come. 
See this guy, he's thinking. He's a, he's a thinker. He's like, we have guests, Yvonne. Yes. We have to, yeah. Awesome. You promised him. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us today, guys. Love you to death. And thank you guys for being here and listening. Uh, if you found value in today's episode, I'm pretty sure some other people in your network would find value. So please share Facebook, Twitter, TikTok. I don't know. Vegas, they do all those kind of things. Smoke signals, uh, <laughs> Morse code. I don't know. Just make sure you're sharing so that other people can uh, receive value and join us next week when we'll do it all over again. And we'll have some more coaches to uh, connect with and find out just how awesome they are. So thank you so much for being here today. Have a great day.